Welcome to Science Unwrapped. This microphone doesn't work very well. Brought to you by the College of Science. Let's talk about ground rules. Most of you have been here before probably, but just in case, I'll remind you that we'll have about 40, 45 minutes of presentation, something like that. We'll see. <laughs> 40 or 45 minutes of presentation, Professor. And um, after that, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes of questions. I hope you'll all just stay seated throughout, all the way through the end of the questions. This room is notoriously noisy, very easy to make a lot of noise, with just a little effort. And so I hope you'll help us keep things as quiet as we can while the presentation's going on during the question and answer session. Thank you. All right. Let me tell you about our speaker. It's Professor David Peake from the physics department here at USU. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you came here about, I guess, you came here about 24, maybe, 24 years ago. <clears throat> and in that time, got older. <laughs> you got a lot older. You got a lot older. But I would say, I think it's fair to say, that in that time, he's had about as big an impact on the undergraduate educational mission of the physics department as anyone in the history of the department. So he's a very distinguished uh, person that he's speaking to you tonight. I tried to make a list of all the awards he's won, and I realized there's no time for that. It's very long. But let me just say, he's won just about every award the university can hand out. He's won numerous national awards, all for his work as a teacher, and in particular for his pioneering work to bring undergraduate research into the university. Now, he's here with his wife, Terry, who is also a distinguished professor here at the university. And they are both avid collectors of art and aficionados of all things art. So of course that makes him a perfect choice for speaking to them. What is more though, his research career, at least a large part of his research career, has been dedicated toward understanding sort of the scientific principles that underlie the emergence of complexity in nature. How simple laws can make complex and interesting features arise. Now, what is more interesting as a complexity emergence in nature than the emergence of art and human civilization? So I'm hoping Professor Peake will give us maybe a little insight into that very ancient question, what is art? We'll see. Professor Peake. Uh, 
But over the years, it has, it has aged very well. And if you look, if you uh, Google Blade Runner, uh, you will find that uh, there are a number of organizations uh, who rank movies, uh, and Blade Runner is often amongst the top hundred uh, movies uh, made ever. And uh, amongst the science fiction movies, uh, there's at least one organization that ranks at number one. So if you have not seen Blade Runner, I highly encourage you to, to, to find it. Uh, you, can, you can see it for free on, on the internet. <laughs> OK, so the star android of uh, Blade Runner uh, is uh, uh, his uh, android name is Roy Batty. Uh, and Roy Batty is, looks very human, uh, but he's actually a robot uh, disguised in a human shell. Uh, and uh, Roy Batty's uh, problem in Blade Runner is he's about to be uh, retired, uh, which means that he's going to go out of business. And he doesn't like that very much. And so that, that's sort of the story. Blade Runner, how, how does Roy Batty cope with this? Uh, and it turns out that in the end, Roy Batty, Batty is not an evil uh, android at all. He's, he's actually a very nice guy. So, what's an android? Well, uh, if you look on Wikipedia, which is the, you know, the old standard of information in the electronic age, uh, it says that it's a humanoid robot. Uh, uh, designed to look and act like a human, especially with a body that has flesh-like color. So uh, that's the last time I'm going to mention the word android, uh, because I don't want to talk about flesh-like covers. I want to talk about robots. So robots are machines that are capable of, uh, so you all think of robots you know, doing stuff like this and picking up stuff. I'm not talking about uh, robots that move, I'm talking about robots that do stuff that are programmed by a computer. So what we're going to talk about uh, uh, in the next few minutes is art produced by robots. Okay? Okay, but in order to really appreciate the feat that is required for a robot to produce something that you and I would call art, uh, we have to talk about artificial intelligence. A little bit. So uh, I, I like to think of artificial intelligence as coming in two flavors. There's big AI, and then there's little AI. Big AI is uh, things like us, except maybe better. Uh, and and uh, has maybe creativity associated with it. Uh, I don't know, maybe it has empathy. Maybe you know, when uh, we're surrounded by great AI machines that take care of us and our old age. Uh, little AI is what happens when you have a, a massive, very fast computer that can solve problems really quick, complicated problems really quickly. Uh, that is, is great. It's really terrific. It may help you drive your autonomous vehicle in the future, uh, but it doesn't philosophize. Okay? It just uh, solves problems. So that's a little bit. OK, so let me give you an example. And I'm sure that some of you have heard about this example. Uh, this is a, a Go board. Uh, the game of Go uh, resides on a 19, a 19 by 19 uh, grid. Uh, and the pieces on, on the uh, Go game are called stones, they're white stones and black stones. And the idea of the game is to basically uh, have your color stone surround your opponent's stone and so that uh, your opponent can't make any more moves. And then uh, the uh, player that has covered the most area with stones is the winner. And uh, I forget exactly what power of 10 it is that uh, the number of moves that are possible in the game of Go is, but it's way, way more than chess. And so the game of Go is widely considered to be the most complicated board game that has ever been developed uh, by humans. 
So, uh, two years ago, uh, a, a program. Uh, what happened? Sorry. I have two screens, so. So, uh, a, a program on, uh, called AlphaGo uh, uh, emerged, and uh, AlphaGo uh, was trained by humans. Uh, humans uh, said to AlphaGo, uh, these are moves that we, in our infinite wisdom and long experience playing this game, which you'll never be able to replicate, uh, we have found to be a very good uh, strategy. And uh, so AlphaGo remembered all of those uh, moves. And uh, because it also had a big, fast uh, search, ca uh, search, uh, search capability, uh, when it played the world champion human in five games, uh, it beat the world champion human four times out of five. And that was a very big event in uh, some people's lives. Uh, it represented, it re represented uh, a, uh, a milestone that we never thought, we humans never thought it would be possible. Surely no machine would ever beat us at the game of Go, but AlphaGo did. And AlphaGo has, not got, has now gotten better. So uh, that's uh, what I would call little AI, because AlphaGo doesn't philosophize, AlphaGo doesn't uh, invent stuff, uh, isn't creative, it just knows the rules of the game and implements them with great precision and uh, great foresight, and is a powerful goal player. Then, uh, this past year, uh, AlphaGo begat <laughs> AlphaGo Zero, and zero means no human intervention. Just the rules of the game. No strategies that humans had ever implemented. And AlphaGo was given the task, these are the rules of Go. Play Go against yourself over and over and over again and tell us what you think. And AlphaGo did that for a couple months. And when it came back, it beat AlphaGo. <laughs> well, which means that it could beat any human. So no, no human. Uh, uh, can stand up to AlphaGo Zero. But here's the deal about AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero came up with Go playing strategies that no human had ever thought about before. And that I call big AI. <laughs> That's creativity. Uh, of course, uh, the people at uh, Google can't uh, leave well enough alone. Uh, so they've invented a, a, a new program called Alpha Zero. <laughs> no go anymore. And Alpha Zero plays three games. It plays Go. It, 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 um, a piece of Alpha Zero is Alpha Go Zero. So it, it, it knows how to play Go very well. Uh, but then uh, it also plays chess, and it plays a Japanese version of chess. And uh, in uh, about four hours, just knowing the rules of the moves of the chess pieces, not given any human input about what's a good strategy. It came up with its own strategies for playing humans. And now, no human can beat Alpha Zero in chess. Thirty years ago, I was talking to a colleague, and uh, he said to me, in our lifetimes, no machine will ever beat a human being in chess. I'm just saying, remember that. <laughs> so, uh, we humans make art, and uh, the question is, well, uh, why do we make art? And Charlie says, maybe I'll tell you what art is, but that's not the <laughs> But I do, I was, okay, I won't, I won't say it all, but uh, you know it when you see it. <laughs> uh, why do we do that? And one of the plausible answers is it makes us smart. And here's uh, old Einstein playing the fiddle. He was actually an accomplished by Einstein. Those of you who are younger than uh, 12, 
if you're not playing an instrument or uh, making visual art, you're missing out on your potential. Your potential will be greatly enhanced if you play an instrument and make visual art. And you parents who haven't made your kids do that, you gotta do it. <laughs> it's the best thing you can do for your kids. Making art makes us smart. So, uh, what does it talk about? Uh, it's a little bit about humans making art. It's a little bit about robots making art. And it's a little bit about AI art. So, since this is a uh, university, uh, the first thing that we should do is have a task. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you five paintings. They're not real paintings, they're images of paintings. But I mean, the, the images are from real paintings. Four of the paintings are made by human beings. And one of them is made by a robot. And you're supposed to guess which one it is. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you the five. The, uh, the five paintings uh, are at different years of, of production. And what we're going to do is we're going to guess of the five, which is the oldest first, which is the next oldest next, and blah, blah, blah. And the last one standing is the one that's made by a robot, and that's the newest painting that, uh, of the five. That's the name. So here, here are the five. The beautiful paintings. You got to memorize them. No, I'll show you. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's call this one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So here's the rules. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you the blown up uh, first. So this is painting number one. It was the one in the upper left hand corner. This is painting number two. That's painting number three. That's four, and that's five. Okay. There they are. Now, here's the rule. The rule is that you're going to clap as hard as you can for the one that you think is the oldest first. Okay? You guys are going to listen and tell me which of the five have got the loudest clap. Okay? Okay. So here they all are again. Okay, who thinks that number one is the oldest? Is it okay, thank you. Uh, number two. Number three. Okay, so I'll remove uh, the next 
all those pending, and it is.
And this is Aaron. So I want you to remember Aaron, because we're going to come back to Aaron in a bit. Okay, before that, I want to talk a little bit about the history of art, but not like art historians talk about. I want to talk about the, the history of art uh, like an anthropologist. So, the first uh, piece of art I want to show you is this. And this piece of art, it doesn't look like much art, but uh, it was intentionally made by some homo species. We don't know which homo species it was. It could be erectus, it could be Neanderthal, it probably wasn't sapiens. Uh, it's 700,000 years old. Uh, this little dimple here uh, is amongst uh, about a dozen identical dimples on a rock that this, this human uh, made uh, with uh, nothing better to do, I guess. Um, incidentally, uh, how many of you think that the dimple is up? Okay. okay. Uh, it's actually down. Uh, and the reason why it's down is over here it's lighter than it is over here. That means that light is coming in this way and it's hitting the back wall of that crater. So those, dim those dimples are down. And so is the snake. I don't know what that is. Okay. So, uh, with uh, nothing better to do, I guess, in the caves, uh, 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 this is a, a, a shell. It's about that big. And then on the side of the shell are these uh, eight, uh, etch marks uh, with, with straight line. No one knows uh, what they mean. Uh, but uh, apparently etching stuff is really important because uh, much uh, uh, younger than the previous slide, are, uh, this is a, a, a shell, it's about that big, and then on the side of the shell are these uh, eight, uh, etch marks uh, with, with a straight line. No one knows uh, what they mean, uh, but uh, apparently etching stuff is really important because uh, much uh, uh, younger than the previous slide are uh, these bones. This is actually the same bone shown uh, in four different uh, uh, photographs of the same bone. But there are a number of bones in Africa, especially that have been found, and many of them are etched uh, like that stone that we saw in, in life. And the etchings tend to be straight lines, parallel to each other. And here's a, a, a drawing of the etching on two sides of this bone. And, okay, now I don't know what to make of this, but uh, the International Encyclopedia of Mathematics attributes uh, this bone to being the first piece of mathematics in the world. And if you look here, you see uh, 11, 13, 17, 19. What commonality does 11, 13, 17, and 19 have? Prime They're primes. Nah. And down here, there's 11 and 21, and there's 19 and 9. Now you may say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But 10 plus 1 is 11. 20 plus 1 is 21. 20 minus 1 is 19. And 10 minus 1 is 9. I don't know if this means anything. <laughs> but there are people who think it does. And one of the bones, not the one shown, but one of the bones uh, has been analyzed to death. And the etch marks are at an angle relative to the long axis of the bone. And the angle uh, uh, makes a, 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 a degree of 5.2, 5.2 degrees. And 5.2 degrees is about the uh, angle of the moon's orbit relative to the Earth's equator. I don't. Anyway, uh, so this talk is about art, but it could just as well, but not like me, be uh, about music. And I want to point out that this is the oldest uh, musical instrument that has been found to date. Uh, it's a whittled bone, and it's 42,000 years old. And so the Homo species, and this is probably Homo sapiens, this is probably us, uh, with nothing better to do in the caves, 
uh, are ma to making art. But art goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, I would claim this might be the most important ancient art object ever found. This uh, didn't hardly look like uh, that when it was found in the cave. And this is uh, uh, after uh, people realized that you can put the pieces in uh, this order. And each of these pieces has a hole in it that has been drilled intentionally. And it looks very much like the intention was to thread uh, 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 some sort of string or something through them to make a necklace. This necklace is 135,000 years old. It's found in Croatia. And it's plausible to claim that this human artist making this necklace had self-consciousness, had consciousness of who she probably or he was. Uh, that is amazing. That is the first tangible evidence that any of us have that human consciousness arose at about the same time that that artwork arose. Art and consciousness are intimately related to each other. So this makes the AI people Twitter. <laughs> so the holy grail of AI is, can we make a robotic artist uh, who is conscious? I mean, that, that would be good. Okay. So, I want to tell you Aaron's story. Uh, Aaron's story. Uh, Aaron was created by a very uh, distinguished painter by the name of Harold Cohen. Harold Cohen uh, represented the UK at important biennials, the big readings of, of, of new painting. Um, and um, his works are. Uh, uh, there, there are 50 some odd of his paintings that are held by the, the Tate Museum, which is the biggest modern art museum, in, well, it's the biggest uh, modern art museum, period. It's the biggest museum that's dedicated solely to modern art in the world. And uh, Cohen got like a sabbatical or something. He got some money to come to the US. He came to the US in uh, the, the late 60s. And he wound up at Stanford and started collaborating or a painting around at least, a group of uh, scientists who were just beginning to study artificial intelligence. And in a little while, Cohen, with his artistic imagination, asked himself, can I make an artificially intelligent artist? And so, but he didn't know how to do it. So uh, he had to learn how to uh, program computers first. And you learn the programming language list, which I guess is still used somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, okay, so you can tell the computer, I want you to make an image somehow. It's, a, it's not so easy to do that, but, but then you got to make an image. And then, so he had to learn how to make images, too. And he didn't know anything about that. And so he uh, had to study enough mechanical engineering to be able to the, the, uh, design a device that would actually paint the images that he was, that the computer was uh, painting. And this took him a long time. So I want to show you Aaron and Cohen. <laughs> yeah, there we are. So this is what I mean by robot. That is the robot. <laughs> okay? There's a, a little computer someplace, which is the brain. And it's, it's inventing images. But this whole big apparatus here is making the image. And uh, at this point in Aaron's career, uh, uh, Aaron was making images on flat sheets of white paper, uh, heavy stock, uh, that were maybe four feet by six feet or something like that. Big, big drawing. Okay. So how did Cohen program uh, Aaron? And, oh, what happened? What happened? Oh, I'm missing. I'll play. Uh, <laughs> so the first images that Aaron made were like a two-year-old <laughs> with a crayon. 
they were just squiggles. And uh, every once in a while, a squiggle would look like something. And Cohen would say to Aaron, uh, remember that. That's good. <laughs> so after a while, Aaron was building up uh, a, a repertoire of good squiggles. Then just by accident, every once in a while, uh, Aaron making one of his good squiggles, I say he, but forgive me, uh, it uh, would uh, concatenate a good squiggle with another good squiggle. And Colin would say, that's good. Remember that. <laughs> okay. So this is 1975. Aaron is uh, making squiggles. And uh, by 1985, the squiggles were beginning to look like that. They were beginning to look like people. <laughs> so, Cohen was really happy <laughs> with Aaron's progress, although it's taken him now 17 years, but uh, hey, you know, making progress. And every time that Aaron would make uh, an, a pleasing looking uh, set of squiggles, uh, Cohen would save it, and Aaron was making uh, black line drawings on white paper. And uh, Cohen would save it, and because Cohen was a painter, Cohen would paint between the lines and make colors out of it. And uh, by this time, uh, a little bit later than that, uh, there was the first showing of Aaron work uh, at, a, at a university. And after, after the showing was over, uh, the paintings that were collaborated on uh, between Aaron and Cohen were sold. And they sold for like $200 a piece. So Cohen said, hmm, this is pretty good. <laughs> so we're going to let uh, Aaron develop. And by 2000, Aaron was doing that. In around 1995, Cohen said, you know, it's not, it's not really proper for me to take Aaron's line drawings and color between the lines. I should program Aaron to make colors in between the lines. And this is a painting by Aaron. Of a, it looks like a human, sort of. Uh, it's got uh, maybe forks for fingers. But <laughs> and uh, Aaron made the, the, the figure and also colored it in. And by this time, uh, Aaron uh, was making lots of figures that looked like people. Some of them were women, some of them were men, some of them you didn't know. Uh, and, uh, Aaron would juxtapose these figures with flowers. There would be flower pots, there would be trees and things like that. And every once in a while, there would be something extraordinarily unsettling and surprising. Like, for example, there would be a purple person. And that was cool. I mean, that was... Like, oh, Aaron is beginning to invent stuff. Now, um, I want to show you Aaron now. Okay, so this is Aaron now. And let me really mix it. So this is Aaron as of 2015. Aaron is owned by the uh, Art Museum on campus, the uh, Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art. Uh, it is on loan in the College of Science. <laughs> um, um, people could come up and look at it, yeah, sure. And you're invited to go upstairs in the second floor in the College of Science office. Look at Aaron uh, doing stuff. Uh, Aaron uh, does this. Well, uh, Aaron would do this uh, ad infinitum if the computer didn't get hot. Uh, sometimes it does. Uh, Aaron has to be cool. Uh, but look, things are, look, over here, something just came in. Aaron, erase something. Uh, Aaron's content for a while. <laughs> so, there's something I can just pop in. 
Okay, okay. fast forward. Okay, so uh, how does the how does this version of Aaron work? This version of Aaron works because uh, in, in, in about 2005, uh, Cohen got sick of seeing people in flower pots, and he decided to go back to the kinds of drawings that he himself was making in the 1960s. And uh, so he, he, he taught Aaron how to make these these very interesting shapes that keep popping in. Oh, there's one. Uh, so uh, Aaron has started with a random number generator. The random number generator says make a green background, and so Aaron colors in the green background. And then it says, well, uh, do stuff. And so Aaron says, okay, what, what can I do? And uh, by some random number uh, cube, it starts making things that look like, you know, I don't know what that is. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing. anyway, uh, this collection of images which keep coming and going and changing color and all of that, reminded Cohen of a, 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 an ancient seascape. And so he entitled this work Before New Time. And it's supposed to be the primordial sea that covered the state of Utah before it became a desert. Um, it's only uh, about an hour and 50 minutes more. <laughs> uh, but I can show you the background changing and the sea creatures changing and Aaron is at work and making purple and all kinds of stuff and it winds up yellow, I think. Uh, Aaron does that. Now, uh, is Aaron inventing stuff? No. What Aaron is doing is uh, creating things on the screen that uh, Colin has said these are good and is armed with a random number generator. So whatever creativity Aaron has is just by uh, tossing a coin. It's, it's, it's random. Uh, and I would call Aaron little AI. Uh, let me get rid of Slideshow. Okay. Aaron is a little. I don't know why. Uh, it's a little AI. Okay. okay. So uh, to wind up here, uh, I want to tell you about a, a new experiment that was just uh, the results of which were just published. Uh, by Rutgers University. So Rutgers University is trying to make an artificial artist that's creative. And uh, this is uh, the architecture of the creator. It has, it has two big parts. One part makes stuff. Uh, that's like Aaron's robotic arm. And then there's uh, something called the discriminator. The discriminator is uh, armed with 80,000 images, human images. And uh, the generator generates an image, and then the discriminator looks at it and says, that's not really art, do it again. And so it feeds it back, and then the generator has to produce something else. And eventually, the generator produces a bunch of stuff that looks humanish, looks artish like. So, how will we know when artificial art is big AI? And of course, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but, um, and I had a snarky answer, and the snarky answer is when an AI role player, which we know is big AI, uh, uh, buys, by uh, asking the first tenant, pay by the cash, buy a check, uh, a painting from an artificial artist, and the artificial artist says, no, you can't give me a check, you have to give me Bitcoin, uh, then we will know that uh, there's big AI art. So, uh, I better start. Thank you.